Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much for giving us your Son, who laid down his life for us, building a bridge between us and you. And we thank you for your Spirit that can give us the courage and the strength to be willing to lay aside the things that we may selfishly want or the things that we may selfishly grasp for or, or that focus on ourselves that, that may drag us apart from you. And to lay that down at his feet and at, at the cross and be able to then serve you and love you. We need your help in that endeavor, Lord. And so as we come to you in this place and as we take a moment to pray to you, we thank you for already reaching out to us. And we ask that you would help us to connect with you in this place and time. Listen and speak to us as we pray to you now. God, we thank you for your grace and your love for us. We thank you for being willing to accept us as a part of your family. And so to you we pray, our Heavenly Father, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Bless you for being here and for being willing to to bravely come out and see what God has in store for you and to encourage the other people around you when you you come and you worship, uh, whether you mean to or not, you actually do encourage the other people that are around. If they were the only ones that showed up for worship, all of a sudden they would feel like, whoa, what, what's going on? And, uh, and so your presence here is a real gift. Um, if you don't know the person sitting next to you, uh, there's a chance that they may not be like regulars here right now. Uh, for the summertime, we have a number of folks that are in the building right now that uh, that you may not know, and, and uh, so as you leave this place in a minute, I'm going to give you the challenge that in terms of your Christian work, something to actually do, I'm going to encourage you to encourage other people as you leave even. Because um, that's part of what we're talking about. We're talking about Christian work. What is it that God would want us to do as we're following Jesus, as our Savior and as our leader, and as his Spirit is starting to lead us and guide us? What is it that we do? And so we've talked about building the kingdom by helping people to know Jesus and and kind of come into the family of God. We've talked about loving God with all of our heart and loving other people. That's what Jesus said. Hey, if you're going to follow me, this is what you got to do. We've talked about the faith that that takes, even faith praying for the miraculous to happen because if God created the whole world, then miracles are kind of his business. (laughs) You know, it's not not a big deal to to listen and to interact with us. Uh, So God will somehow answer, and then we have to understand what, what is it, Lord, that you're doing. If we likened it to something that maybe would be easier to understand, if you think about a McDonald's, McDonald's main work, if you work for McDonald's, that what you're trying to do is to sell food, right? Yeah, I mean, that's what you're trying to do. If you bought the property, you're like, wait a second, I'm not selling food, I'm buying the property. If you're building a McDonald's, well, that's, that's you know, how does that play into that? If you're... Um, uh, if, if you're mopping the floors, you know, you don't feel like you're selling food right then. But everything revolves around helping them to sell food, right? So if you then are doing something and God has put it for you to do, it may not look 
glamorous or it may not look like you're building the kingdom of God, but if you're doing what God wants, then that is a part of the whole plan. Mopping floors or building a building or whatever, if you're doing it what God wants you to do, you're helping to build God's kingdom and you're doing Christian work. For today's message then, I want to look at, at how we do that kind of overall in terms of humble service. Sometimes the word love has different connotations, and in this culture, it's kind of hard to understand what love is, but maybe, maybe we'll get an even better understanding of that if we say, okay, we're to humbly serve other people. For instance, in Galatians 2, it's a part of the Bible, inspired by God. Uh, the, the guy that's writing it is writing to the Galatian Christians, and here's what he writes a couple thousand years ago. It says, after the death and the resurrection of Jesus, the Christ. So he says, through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. Now, this is not the law of Ohio or the United States law. This is the law of God given to Moses and then to the Jewish people. This is a Jewish guy, and he's writing, and he's saying, I died to the law. And we're going to say, what? What are you talking about? I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith, and the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, I want to kind of lean into this for a second. Say, how in the world does this work? Because you've got the whole idea of Jesus is crucified. And you know, that's why we have the cross in Christianity. He's nailed to a cross. He dies on the cross. Before that happened, he said, I'm going to give my life as a ransom for many. So he died for you. He died for me. You might read this letter and say, wait a second, is Paul saying that Jesus only died for him? So he's like, Jesus died for me. All the rest of you suckers are out of luck. You know what I mean? Is that what he's saying? No, that's not what he's saying. You know, when we say Jesus died for me, that's not like exclusive of you. That's saying he died for all of us. So you, you can say Jesus died for me, just as he does when he's writing this under the God's inspiration. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. I've been crucified with Christ, and then I no longer live, but Christ lives in me through me. What? Well, remember, Jesus, before he was crucified on the cross, he said, I'm going to lay down my life for my friends, for the family of God. He says, I'm going to give my life as a ransom. It's almost like payment. He's standing in for you and for me. We identify with him. He identifies with us. In human terms, we can kind of understand this. Not exactly the same, but kind of where if the president of the United States goes to another country and then they attack the president, have they attacked you? Kind of, right? We're now going to go to war with whatever country just attacked our president, right? He in some way represents you and me. When he goes and they do something to him, they're doing it to all of us. Likewise, if you do something really, really bad, which, how many of you have, you know, just really, really bad, like you've killed somebody, or, wow, you didn't know I was going to go there, did you? You're starting to raise your hand. I didn't do that, you know, no. But if you did something really, really bad, the president can pardon you, right? And it gets really controversial. Oh, that person shouldn't have been pardoned, or something like that. He can somehow not, but it's not exactly the same. It's kind of, it's, but not exactly, because Jesus says, I'm going to die for you. I'm not just going to pardon you, but I'm going to take the punishment that you should feel. If you were a Jew in this time, the law was very intimidating. It was beautiful, and it helped you to know how not to hurt other people and how to receive God's blessing. It was beautiful, but it was also really demanding. And so it would be very easy for you to walk around feeling kind of bad about yourself because you realize, ah, I'm doing these sacrifices and I'm asking God for forgiveness, but man, I just don't know. I mean, what I've done is pretty bad. God's holiness, he's so holy and so perfect, and I just don't know, you know. And Paul's like, look, I get that. So when Jesus died for me, I died to the law. It's not that it doesn't have any um, suggestive power anymore. It still can tell you what's right and wrong, what you ought to do. But the guilt and shame that you may feel and deserve Paul's like, look, I'm the worst of sinners. Not real popular at parties. I'm the worst of sinners. Who wants to put that RSVP? No, you know. But this is who he said he was. He's like, by looking at how holy God is, I realize I don't measure up. By looking at the law, I realize I'll never measure up. I won't be able to eternally obey the law. And so Jesus is like, yes, I know. 
I'll die for you so that you also die to the law. Then as you live, you can live by Christ's leading, by his example, and by the Holy Spirit's power guiding you. And some of the law you'll obey, don't murder. Some of it you may be totally free from, don't eat pork, you know, that's kind of up to you and your conscience, whether you think that that, you know, so, so as the Christians lived out the law, they're like, okay, I'm going to be led by the Spirit, not just the law anymore. I died to the law. You may be here right now feeling really, really horribly guilty. You may say, what's wrong with me? And I'd say, well, we all, we all feel that way sometimes. If we don't, we probably should. <laughs> like, guilt that brings us to God's feet to say, forgive me, is a good thing. But once you're forgiven, Satan may still make you try to feel guilty, but you say, no, 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 I, I was crucified with Christ. I do deserve to be punished. I was, in a way, because Jesus said, this counts for you, Nathan. This counts for you out there, right? So, I now will live as Christ lives in me. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by what? Say it with me. Faith. Oh, you can't always see it, but you know it's real. You know you ought to do it. So you live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's a radical change of how we're going to live and think. Right? Now, hopefully that makes enough sense that we're getting ready to kind of dive into the, the meat of the main passage I wanted to get to today, the book of Luke. Writing about Jesus, writing the words of Jesus and what, what he did. Luke chapter 7 is where we're going. We're thinking about how radically Jesus loves us and lays down his life for us. So now radically, we're going to lay ourselves down and serve the Lord and serve other people. Those are the images you've got in mind. Mark, would you kind of come and read from the book sure. of Luke for us? Now when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, Jesus went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now, a woman in the town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar full of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When a Pharisee had invited him, saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Now he was thinking to himself, but Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had money to pay him back. <coughs> Excuse me. So he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose one of the, the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown, but whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Now the other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. After this, Jesus traveled around from one town to the village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from the woman whom seven demons had come out, Joanna, the wife of Chosa, the manager of Harold's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. This is response to the woman. Your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. 
go in what? Do you need peace? You know? Are there times in life where you're just like, oh man, like I am, I'm a mess. Jesus is the one to come to, you know? But look how the woman comes to him. I mean, she is embarrassingly humble. Humility and in, in the word humble, um, when I was a youth pastor, a lot of the teenagers honestly had no idea of what that word meant. It was so foreign to pop to kind of popular culture, that they were like, I'm not even sure what that means. This idea that you would lower yourself and say, okay, I'm going to serve you with, you know, kind of no expectation you're going to pay me or anything like that. You may not even be as important as I am. You may not have as much money or status as I am, but I'm going to come and I'm going to help you or I'm going to serve you or I'm going to just simply um, tell you how great you are, and I'm not going to brag about myself. I'm just going to lower myself to you. I mean, that's the idea, right? And, I mean, think about that. Isn't that a little radical? I mean, you don't have, like, a class in school, Humility 101, right? I mean, you're taught go after whatever you want, get what you want, focus on yourself. I was just recently talking with uh, a lady who has spent her life with that understanding, and it makes sense. Like, everything around her kind of trained her to do that, but in looking at her life right now, I, I, I mean, I was like internally in turmoil for her because I can see different parts of her life kind of unraveling right now. And, and, and I'm sure in her mind, it, it doesn't make sense. It's like, wait, I've focused on what I want my whole life. Why am I not happy now in my later years? Why, why not? You know, and it's like God, God explained it a long time ago. He's like, look, if, if you humble yourself, and you serve the Lord like that and, and actually focus on what God wants and, and trying to help other people around, if you, if you do it the way that God wants you to, not out of your own kind of, you know, need or, you know, just kind of, because you can spin it selfishly even like that, but if you just say, no, I'm going to do what God wants me to do, then you find out that you're a, a lot more content and you have a lot of what you actually truly need by not focusing on yourself, but by focusing on God. Isn't that weird? Isn't that backwards? But I, I saw it just recently. I'm like, oh my gosh. And I, and I know I shouldn't be surprised, right? I mean, I preach about that stuff, but, but sometimes when you see it face to face, you're like, wait a second. So here's the Pharisee who owns the house, who has the respect. He invites Jesus to his house. He's the one with power, prestige, everything else. You, you know, he's expecting probably Jesus to say, high five, you're doing great, right? I mean, that's probably what the Pharisee's thinking. I'm a great guy. And instead, it's this woman who has such a bad reputation that her reputation's in the Bible that it was bad. Right? That's bad, right? We don't know what she did. We don't know what kind of stuff she's been into. But she comes in. She crashes the party. She's embarrassingly humble because she comes in and starts wetting his feet with her tears and wiping it with her hair. I mean, as degrading as can possibly be. Why? Because she believes this guy is the one that she needs approval from and forgiveness from and maybe even loves her enough to offer it. Because the Pharisee sure doesn't, does he? He's going to want to kick her out of the house. And so Jesus spins it into a teachable moment and he's like, look, she's being forgiven of a lot. You, the Pharisee, don't even think that you need forgiveness. That's why she's excited that I'm here. She's humbling, and she's using this really expensive perfume to wash my feet. You wouldn't do that. You put that on the head. But he, she's putting it on his feet. You, in this culture, no way would a Jewish writer have made this up this way. There was a Jewish prayer that the Pharisees had even taught that said, for men especially, right, Lord, thank you that I'm not a woman. True. Google that if you want. That's, that was an ancient Jewish prayer, part of an ancient Jewish prayer. Thank you that I'm not a woman. A Jewish writer would not have made up this story where the main hero is washing Jesus' feet with her tears in her hair, and then it says that the women were the ones at that time standing up, following Jesus, loving him, and supporting his ministry. Uh-uh. You would not spin this story like that. Must have been true. It's that radical, and it's beautiful. And you think about that. If I will humble myself and love the Lord like that, because he loved me enough to be crucified for me, standing in the gap for me, taking all the punishment for me. Wow, it's powerful. So then I'm going to offer at the end of this message a, a prayer where we then 
to the best that we can today, we put ourselves into that humble service kind of way. Lord, I'm going to do what you want. I need you. I'm going to follow you. And that, that's kind of where we're going. Now, there are a couple of different ways that we might be kind of pushing against this. And I, and I get it. And there's a part of me that doesn't want that to be true, don't really want to do that. Um, there are two different things that we can do that, that kind of go against this whole idea. The, the first one, do you like that top picture? You know, um, I was like that sometimes as a kid, right? You know, let's say that you stole the cookie and then mom had told you not to take the cookie, you know, and is your normal automatic human response, oh, mother, thou art good. I am a sinner. I am sorry. You know, I mean, is that what we normally, naturally did? I mean, maybe, but a lot of us, you know, kind of had this, ah, eh, but mom, it was such a good cookie, and you're such a good cook, you know, or my brother made me do it, you know, <laughs> it was his fault, you know, or we, we, we underestimate our own sinfulness, you know. Mom, I was hungry, so I did it, you know. And all of us, I mean, sometimes we don't totally outgrow this, you know. If, I, <laughs> if a cop pulls you over speeding, you know, <laughs> Uh, well, I was in a hurry. You know, I mean, I remember I was going really, really fast, and I'm like, well, but I had to go get to work, you know. I'm a hardworking guy. I was working in a grocery store, you know. That's why I was doing 30 miles an hour over the speed limit, sir, you know. And he didn't pat me on the head and say, oh, that's okay, right? I mean, I'm, under, I'm underestimating my wrongness. I'm underestimating my sin. That happens. Well, I, I justify it. Well, I just wasn't raised right, you know. Oh, I'm hungry, so I'm, 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 I'm mean, you know, that kind of stuff. No, no, no. When we come into face-to-face with a holy God, an absolutely holy God, who has a, a holy, perfect standard of love and goodness, at some point, that's going to sink in, and we will be humbled, it may not be until we die and we see God face to face that we realize it, but I hope and pray it'll be before then where we say, no, I really do need Jesus' death to count for me. Because if he's standing there before God the Father and I'm being judged and he's willing to say, hey, yeah, Nathan deserves punishment, but I, I took care of that. You know that. And I say, yeah, I, I admitted that a long time ago, again and again even. I need that, Lord then I'm, I've died with Christ. I don't, I'm not going to be burning in hell for that, right? I mean, that's the way that works. The other thing that we might do to kind of miss this whole idea is to underestimate the difference that Jesus is going to make and how different it is to live as Christ living through us. And this, I hope and pray that all of us can grow in our understanding and, and living it out every day. That's kind of a Methodist way. We try to do a method of trying to grow in our Christ-likeness because it's not automatic all the time, and we struggle sometimes. And sometimes we just lose the vision of how weird and different this is. Let me give you an example. Um, a quick poll, and I'm going to raise my hand first. How many of you sometimes worry pretty badly about the future? either having enough money or your health or something like that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for raising your hands because visitors might be like, whoa, do these people all think they're perfect and better than me? <laughs> no, we don't. Like, we're, we're right there with you. We're struggling. Jesus said, worry about today, not tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to have enough troubles of its, of its own. That's Matthew 5. And you're looking at just today. If I could plan out my future by just listening to Jesus today, Jesus is a better long-range planner than I am, right? And he's a better long-range planner than you are. But our whole culture says, ah, maybe there's a God, maybe there's not, so you need to do all of your planning for the future on your own. Well, no wonder we get stressed out because you don't know what the market's going to do. You don't know what your health's going to do. You don't know if you're going to die tonight. You don't know any of that stuff. So it's built-in stress and worry. But Jesus says, just take it today, worry about today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Let me worry about tomorrow. Do what you're to do today. And sometimes he'll say, hey, save up this or invest this way or give it over to that person or go talk to this person or, you know, hey, go to work because you're supposed to, you know, or whatever. We just today, just worry about today. And then he's doing the long-range planning. I mean, 
the little kid looking in the mirror of, of the water seeing Jesus, I mean, that, that's a Jesus way to live out life. That's weird, though, right? I mean, that's different. And you may rub shoulders sometimes with somebody that gets really good at this, and everybody around them is scratching their head going, what's the deal? They ought to be stressed out. They ought to be worried. They ought to be all down because of their health problems, any number of things. But they've got this right. Jesus is living out through them. And they're like, you know what? I'm going to do today exactly what Jesus wants. I will have read his written word in the Bible, and then I will have prayed my heart out, and then I'm going to live moment by moment doing what God wants. Aren't you worried about tomorrow? You should be worried about tomorrow. No, because God's got it. (laughs) Ah, that's beautiful. It's hard to get there, though. So if we were to then pray something like um, what I think is the next slide. Would you guys go to the next slide? If you ask yourself, what would it look like for you and for me to live with the kind of humble service that that woman had that would be not afraid of being embarrassed, not afraid of being, you know, looked down upon. I don't care what other people are going to do. I'm just going to do what God wants, and I'm going to be humble before the Lord. I'm going to wash his feet, then I'm going to turn to other people and live in peace and faith. What would that look like? For me, the prayer that I would have to pray would have to go something like this. Jesus, in your, your death, I died. I'm going to have to die to certain things that plague me, either you know, guilt and shame or frustration that I can't get everything done that I need to or you know, just those things that just always keep coming up or my own selfishness. Man, I'm just going to have to die to it. There is no modifying it. It just needs to die. Jesus, in your death, I died. Give me a new life of radically humble service. It's going to be radical. Radical. Oh my gosh, it's going to be radical. You know, I'll share generously. I'll pray faithfully. I'm just going to carve out time to be with the Lord. Or I'm going to forgive that person that none of my family ever believes that I could ever forgive. But I'm going to forgive them. Man, it's going to be awesome. And then by putting your spirit in me and living through me. Ah, that's the kicker. If you walk out of here and say, I could never do that. Jesus is like, I know. That's why I'm going to do it through you. It's going to be amazing. (laughs) You're going to be amazing as the Spirit gives you that faith. One day at a time, I'm going to live. I'm going to serve you, Lord, and I will serve other people. That woman that washed feet with her hair, I'm going to be like that in my own way. You're like, I'm off the hook. I'm bald. (laughs) No, you're not. This is all a metaphor. This is all a metaphor. You're, You're doing exactly what God wants. Humbly serving the Lord and humbly serving other people. I'm going to give you just a a minute of silence. Think about that prayer. Do you identify with that? Is that your heart's desire? Then pray that silently and then I'll pray it aloud. Let's pray. Jesus, in your death, I died. Give me a new life of radically humble service by putting your spirit in me and living through me. We receive that which you want to give with open arms and hearts. God's people said amen, amen, amen.